Hey everyone. So today we are going to be continuing working with our unit on the author. Last time we worked on author's purpose and this time we're going to be working on author's point of view. So before we get going, um, I want to talk a little bit about what point of view means. And the first thing that I want to think of is this word view. When we think of view, we think of seeing something or looking at something, right? Like the view out my window is of my front yard today, or the view out my uh, car window is wherever I happen to be driving past. So view talks about what we see and how we look at something. Now point of view talks about how you specifically see something. So for example, if we're back in the classroom, the point of view from my desk in the front of the classroom is very different from the point of view that you would see from say the back of the classroom. We see things differently, we see things at different angles and they don't always look the same to us. So when we talk about point of view, I'm gonna label it as POV for right now, point of view. Um, point of view is all about how we see something. And what we wanna remember is that we don't always see things in the exact same way. So something that I see, for example, from my desk as the teacher, is not the same thing that you see from your desk as the student. Now, how does this work with the author's point of view? So author's point of view talks about how the author sees something. So these are specifically related to the author themselves. Uh, and we're gonna say that they're how the author sees or feels about something. And we're gonna look at some examples of how this works in just a little bit. So on your definition sheet where we are adding all of our vocabulary words and definitions, we wanna go ahead and add in this idea about author's point of view. So if you need to take some extra time to write this out, go ahead and pause the video here so you can uh, finish writing out your definition. And I'll come back to this definition in a little bit. So for today's lesson, you wanna make sure that you have a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper or your notebook to take notes in. All right. So the reason that we are working on author's point of view today is because it matches a GED reading skill. So this is a skill that we need to have to help us be better readers for the GED test. So the reason that we focus on this as the skill, we're gonna say that that skill really helps us to determine the meaning of a word or phrase um, as they're seen in a text. And specifically it says here, including determining connotative and figurative meanings from context. So we're gonna be spending some time today talking about what this word means, connotative. So by the end of today's lesson, we are going to be able to distinguish between denotative and connotative meanings of a word. And we're gonna be able to explain how context shapes or lends meaning to a specific word. Those are our goals for our lesson today. So before we get moving with those goals, we're gonna play a little game of would you rather. So when you play would you rather, you are given two options and you need to choose the one that you like best. So in this case, I have four examples of sets of words. What I want you to do is pause the video here and decide which word in each set you would rather be described as. So when you look at the first set, for example, we see hardworking or workaholic. You need to decide which word you want someone to describe you as. So go ahead and pause the video here, read through your four uh, sets of words and choose the one that you feel applies most to you. All right, so when I look at my sets of words, I'm going to show you which words that I would rather be described as and which ones I might be, um, even if I don't want to be described as them. So my first set is hardworking versus workaholic. I definitely feel like I am hardworking and I would rather be described as hardworking as well. Um, conceited or self-confident? Hmm. Okay, well, I definitely don't wanna be described as conceited. 
So I'm going to say that I feel I would rather be described as self-confident. Firm or stubborn? This one is a tricky one for me. I would rather be described as firm, but I think sometimes I can be pretty stubborn. But since I asked which one I would rather be described as, I'm going to go ahead and choose firm. And then my last set is flexible or indecisive. Ooh, this is another hard one for me because I am both of those things. I am both flexible and, and indecisive. But since I want to know which one I would rather be, I'm going to go ahead and choose flexible here. So let's talk about why I chose specific words and why I didn't pick the other one. A lot of it comes down to what these words mean to me. So when I think of somebody who is hardworking, I think of someone who works hard. I think of someone who is good at their job, someone who really puts in the effort and someone that I can trust. So like if I need help with something, I am gonna ask someone who I feel is hardworking. Now, when I look at this word workaholic, workaholic to me just doesn't mean the same thing in the same way. I know that when I add this ending to something, a holic, it means like an addiction to something. So like you could be an alcoholic. Um, and when I hear workaholic, I just don't feel the same way about it. I still think that this is a person who works hard, but I really think that this is a person who works too much. This is a person who seems to have no personal life or no boundaries. Um, and everything they do is about work. They don't know how to take a break. They don't know how to separate. Everything they do just focuses on work. And, you know, I don't really think that that's me. I do spend a lot of time thinking about work and doing work, but I don't feel like I, I can't separate. And I don't feel like that my life is all about work for that. All right, how about conceited and self-confident? So I chose the word self-confident because that's what I think I am. I, I have a good trust in myself. I have very positive feelings about myself. I feel like um, I am confident in my abilities. I trust myself. Yeah, and I would say that I am just confident in general. So I had said that I did not want to be described as conceited. So conceited to me means that you are very full of yourself. Um, you still feel positively about yourself, but you, you almost take that to the bad level where you are, you get the feeling like you are better than someone else. And I think also when we talk about conceited, someone who is conceited, this can talk about um, your looks, your intelligence. Like you can be conceited about a lot of things. So for me, I would just rather be described as uh, self-confident rather than conceited. I don't wanna take it too far. With firm and stubborn, I chose firm. Um, now, that isn't to say that I'm not a little bit stubborn. So when I think of this word firm, I think of someone who sets boundaries, someone who is confident and comfortable in their answer. Now, when I think of someone who is stubborn, I almost get the feeling that stubborn is like an unwillingness to change. And that can be something like you're unwilling to change your behaviors, you're unwilling to change your opinions about something, you're just, you're not very flexible, you just are very stubborn. And when I think about this, I think a lot of the relationship that parents and kids have as a parent, you have to be pretty firm and you have to put your foot down and know when to set certain boundaries. But kids can just be so darn stubborn when they want something or want something done their way. They don't really have the either linguistic ability or the rationale to be able to explain that to you. So I always think that firm is more of like an authority, like a parent and stubborn is a lot more like a kid. 
Now, like I said, I can be pretty stubborn when it comes to certain things. So I don't necessarily think it's um, a bad thing. I think it's just something that it's better to be firm than it is to be stubborn about something because I think it comes down to that idea of being unwilling to do something. That's where it gets for me. All right, and then flexible and indecisive. I prefer to be flexible. It means that I am willing to change. It means that I am willing to um, change my behaviors. I'm willing to change the way I do things, how I interact with other people. Um, I can help when it's needed. Like I'm pretty flexible when it comes to stuff at work. Now indecisive is literally, the word indecisive means the inability to make a decision. So when we think about someone who is indecisive, we just see someone who has a really hard time choosing options. So like when I'm at work, for example, I'm very flexible. I will do whatever I need to do. I'm very helpful. I don't mind changing plans, but at home I can be pretty indecisive. So like if my husband asks, what do you want for dinner? I might just go, I don't know. I'm not really sure. And I don't really have a decision to make there. So when we look at all of these words, all of these words have a feeling that they make us feel. And generally those feelings are going to be either positive feelings or they're going to be negative feelings. So those positive feelings are words that make you feel good or words that you would prefer to be described as. And your negative feelings are words that kind of make you feel negatively. So hardworking is definitely a positive word and workaholic is more of a negative word. Conceited is more of a negative word and self-confident is more positive. Firm is more positive, whereas stubborn is more negative. Flexible is more positive, whereas indecisive is more negative. Now, all of these words make us feel a certain way. And that isn't to say that they are good or bad. It just means that in general, when we use them, they have a positive or negative feeling that is attached to them. That feeling that we have is called connotation. And I'm gonna give you the definition of connotation on the next slide. So don't worry about writing it down yet. I'm gonna show it to you in just a minute. So all of the words that we've looked at here have a positive or negative connotation. They make us feel a certain way. They also have what is called a denotation. Now a denotation, again, this word is gonna be on the next slide, so don't worry about writing it down yet. A denotation is the actual meaning behind a word, like the dictionary definition. So hardworking and workaholic actually mean very close to the same thing. They just mean that this is a person who is working hard and uh, is very good at what they do. Same thing for conceited or self-confident. When we talk about conceited or self-confident, we see someone who is having positive feelings about themselves. The way that we express those positive feelings is what takes us from being conceited or self-confident. Firm and stubborn both mean that you're willing to hold your ground on something. And flexible and indecisive both mean that you have the ability to um, go with the flow when things happen. So let's go ahead and talk about those definitions and what they mean. So connotation, oops, sorry about that guys, too many eyes happen in there. <laughs> connotation is the way a word makes me feel or the way I feel about a word. Now, when we talk about connotation, Connotation can be positive, it can be negative, and it can be neutral. So when we talk about this, we are saying that the way a word makes us feel or the way we feel about a word is our connotation. So when we look at positive connotations, we know that these things are things that make us feel good. When we talk about negative connotations, these are the things that make us feel not so good. And then when we talk about something that is neutral, neutral is a word that does not have a positive or negative feeling attached to it. 
So for example, I might be able to say the sky is blue today. I don't really tell you how I'm feeling about it. I've just told you that the sky is blue. That's neutral language. But if I said today is a beautiful day and the sky is gorgeous and blue, I've changed it to being something positive. So neutral is generally something that we see a lot more for facts. So a good rule of thumb here is that the author's purpose helps. If the author's purpose to, is infor to inform you, we should be seeing a lot of facts. And those facts should be neutral. We shouldn't be showing a lot of opinions when we talk about that. When we deal with persuade, persuade is talking all about opinions or the way you feel about something. And these opinions can be positive or negative. Now denotation, our next word, denotation is the literal de dictionary definition of a word. So when we talk about something that has connotation or denotation, words will have both. So we can be looking for both types of, word, of, of ideas when we are reading a word. So denotation just literally means what a word means. So if you were to look it up in the dictionary, that says denotation. So for example, when we did hardworking and workaholic, both of those words have similar denotations because they both mean that you are working hard. Now, words will have similar denotations, but they may have completely different connotations. So we want to be able to use that as a way to look out for an author's point of view. So for example, if an author is feeling very positive about something, they're going to use those positive words. If an author is feeling very negative about something, they're going to use those negative words. And if an, an author is not trying to show you their personal feelings, they're probably going to be a little bit more neutral. If you um, are still copying down these definitions, go ahead and pause the video here before you continue on. Okay, so let's do a little bit of practice. We are going to practice deciding whether or not a word is positive, negative, or that word's denotation. So when I look at the first one there, I see the words aroma, smell, and odor. So when I think about where I've heard these words in the past, I want to think about how I've heard them used. So when I hear that word odor, the very first thing that that makes me think of is deodorant. You don't want to have an odor, so you wear deodorant. It also makes me think of skunks and garbage. Those things also have um, an odor. That's why I've heard that word before. So when I put all of those things together, um, having body smells, having skunk smells, having trash smells, all of those things feel very negative for me. So I think that that word is my negative word. And then I have aroma and smell. Well, smell, I think I could go either way. I'm not really sure if it's positive or negative because sometimes I use it to mean good things and sometimes I use it to mean bad things. Um, so I'm gonna look at that word aroma. When I hear aroma, I think about food. That is my first thought. So like when you come home and there's something really good smelling in your house, you say, oh, that's a pleasant aroma. So for me, aroma, I think is a positive word. That means that word smell is your denotation. That means that both of these words, aroma and odor, both mean something that smells. And that makes sense to me. So I would like for you to try the next three on your own, pause the video, and in your notes, decide whether or not each word or phrase is your positive word, your negative word, or your denotation. All right, so let's look at them together. We have look at, stare, and gaze. So I'm gonna take that word gaze first. So when I hear gaze, it makes me think of stargazing when you go outside and look at the stars. It also makes me think of the thing that a couple does when they're really in love. They look at each other with those really lovely eyes and you can just kind of tell that they're really excited to be around someone. So I think that gaze is my positive word. Uh, stare and look at. Hmm. Okay, well stare for me feels really uncomfortable. Like when someone stares at you, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. So I'm going to assume that stare is my negative word, and that means that look at is my denotation. Does that make sense? Stare and gaze both mean that you look at something. Ah, that makes sense to me. All right, we have discuss with someone, argue, and debate. 
Hmm. Well, when I think about arguing, that to me is automatically a negative thing. I don't like arguing and I don't think it's very helpful. Um, so arguing to me is negative. Discuss with someone and debate. Both of these could be positive words if we think about them, but I think that discuss with someone is probably your denotation because that's what you're doing in both of the cases for argue and debate, which means that debate is going to be my positive word here. All right, mansion, house, shack. Well, all of these things mean the same thing. They're all a place that you could live. So you want to think about which one of these carries the positive feeling. So when I think of a house, house to me has positive feeling. But then when I think of mansion, I think of like a bigger house. Um, I consider my home to be kind of mansionly. I don't think it's very big, but I, I care about it the way I care about a mansion. So I'm going to say that that's my positive word. I think shack is probably my negative word because when I think about a shack, I think of a small, really run down, uncared for building that people live in. So I'm gonna say shack is more my negative word, which means house is my denotation. It represents both of those places as a place you can live. Nicely done, everybody. So we're gonna take this and we're gonna look at some other examples. So now that we've gotten comfortable looking at just the words themselves, we are gonna be looking at how we use our words to decide whether or not something has a positive, negative, or neutral point of view. So we have three examples on our page here. So our first one, the state of Alaska is without question our most beautiful state. Its towering peaks, abundant wildlife, and unspoiled wilderness are without equal. So I wanna think about both the author's purpose for writing this and the author's point of view, which is how they feel about what they're writing about. So in this particular one, the author is writing about Alaska. So I wanna to think to myself, what types of feelings does this author have about Alaska? I see that they've called it our most beautiful state. We have towering peaks, abundant wildlife, unspoiled wilderness, and everything is without equal. All of those things put together are very positive. So this author definitely feels very positively about Alaska. So I'm thinking that this author's purpose is probably to persuade me because we're seeing a lot of that positive wording. Remember that if your purpose is to inform, you are generally going to see a lot more neutral words. All right, let's do our next one. Longing for the cruise of a lifetime, you'll want to try the Ice Queen. It will seem like a lifetime by the time you get off. Short on staff and long on overheated cabins, the ship will take you on an endurance cruise you won't soon forget. And the food? Bring your own or suffer the consequences of the so-called delicacies put before you. Wow, that's an interesting read. So again, we want to be looking for the author's purpose and the author's point of view. So I'm going to look for point of view first. How does this author feel about the Ice Queen, about this cruise? Okay, it will seem like a lifetime by the time you get off. I don't know if I want to be on a ship for a lifetime. Something is short on staff, which is never good. It's never good to not have enough people to help. Long on overheated cabins, which means it's just too hot on that ship. It is an endurance cruise you won't soon forget. I don't think I'm forgetting it for the wrong, for the right reasons. It wasn't a memorable cruise. It was bad. And the food, bring your own or suffer the consequences. Wow, that is a negative thing if I've ever heard one. So I'm thinking that this author's purpose, the point of view here is very negative. They do not have very positive feelings about the Ice Queen. And I kind of get the feeling that they are trying to persuade me not to go on that cruise. And quite honestly, I feel persuaded. I'm not gonna go on that cruise. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's look at our last one. Mayor Simpkins, three cheers. A new tax plan will create the revenue needed to repair the crumbling city infrastructure give pay raises to the police and open more shelters and pave more streets. This unpopular but long needed plan demonstrates that our mayor is a politician with leadership skills. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out author's purpose and author's point of view. So we'll look for that point of view first. Um, a politician with leadership skills, that seems pretty positive. I wanna have someone in charge who can be a good leader. The idea that you give someone three cheers that's nice. Um, the tax plan will create revenue. 
needed to do a lot of things. That sounds positive. So overall, I think this author feels pretty positively about Mayor Simpkin. And I think that their purpose, again, is to persuade here. They're trying to convince us that Mayor Simpkins is doing the right thing. So now that we've kind of looked at some smaller readings, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some newspaper articles that came out of the Herald Leader. So these came from Lexington's newspaper from the weeks, uh, the last weeks of November. So you can find them there if you'd like to. So our first example here, we have, let's help Lexington do a better job with recycling as it makes changes to program by Kathy McDonald. So we are once again going to look for her purpose and point of view as she's writing. All right, I asked, is this the recycling bin? Oh yeah, but it doesn't matter, the worker replied. It's clear that the city's recycling responsibility lies not only on local businesses, but also on individuals at home. However, a walk through my neighborhood the eve before a cycling pickup revealed a similar story of seemingly negligence and disrespect. A greasy pizza box, a Tupperware lid, plastic yogurt containers, and bubble wrap were among some of the items that the Lexington recycle workers will be pulling off conveyor belts and tossing the following day. Please visit the website to review Lexington's newest guidelines for November 2020. There is an exciting change. Here are a few tips to better understand some of the more confusing rules for proper recycling. And like I said, this is from the Herald Leader. It's not the whole article. So if you do want to read the whole article, you can follow that link below and it will take you where you want to go to read that article. So I want to talk about um, Miss McDonald's purpose and her point of view. I want to think about what is her point of view when it comes to recycling in general. And what is her point of view about the people who are supposed to be recycling. So let's talk about recycling in general. When we look at the end here. Well, first and foremost, she's writing an article about why we should be recycling. So that kind of tells me that she's feeling kind of positively about it. I also see that she talks about an exciting change to recycling that kind of tells me that she really wants people to be recycling. So I think she feels in general pretty positive about recycling. So how does she feel about the people who are recycling? I get the feeling that she is much less positive about the people that are recycling. And there are a couple of words that tell me why she feels negatively about those people. So when she walks through her neighborhood, she sees negligence and disrespect when it comes to um, recycling. And that to me tells me that she feels that the people who are recycling just are not doing a good job. So she has this negative point of view about them. So what could her purpose be? I think the purpose of this article could be two things. Number one, it could be to inform us. And I see that because at the very end here, she talks about steps for steps and tips for recycling better. That's definitely informational. But I also think that her purpose here is to persuade. I think she's trying to convince us that we all need to be doing a better job of recycling and doing it for the good of all of the people around us. Okay, so let's look at our next one. So this comes, next three actually come from letters to the editor uh, of the Herald Leader, and they all come from November 25th, 2020. All right, so again, we are gonna be looking for author's purpose and author's point of view. Alrighty, let's give it a whirl. University of Kentucky fan cutouts, ridiculous. Another money grab by UK Athletics are the 50 to $70 fan cutouts in Rep Arena and Memorial Coliseum for the coming basketball season. If people are willing to spend $50 just to feed their own vanity, then they might wanna stop reading now. If not, why not donate 50 or $70 to one of dozens of quality charitable groups in the bluegrass? Please, before you waste your money on a fan cutout, find a charity that needs your help. They all do. And this comes from Richard Fern in Lexington. So let's think about how he feels. And I wanna know how he feels about the cutouts and how he feels about charity. So I want you to pause the video here and think about what words or phrases in here 
signal to you how this author feels, how Mr. Fern feels about both the cutouts and the charity. So go ahead and pause it and try it first. All right, so let's talk about the cutouts. Mr. Fern here uses some very specific words here to tell me how he feels. He uses words like ridiculous, money grab, and feeding your own vanity. So I definitely feel that he has just a negative point of view about these cutouts. He is not on board with them. Now for charity, he says that um, charities need your help. And he's offering that as a way to you know, spend your money wisely. So I think he feels pretty positively about these charities. He also calls them quality charitable groups, which means that he feels that they are worth it. So what's this author's purpose? I definitely think his purpose is to persuade us not to be buying the fan cutouts and instead to be donating to charity. Okay, let's do our next one. Again, from a letter to the editor on November 25th. One can call into question Governor Andy Bessier's decisions, but not his leadership. As a former administrator in both the public and private sector, it is my humble opinion that his handling of the pandemic has exemplified the definition of leadership. The partisan nature of the criticisms cut to the heart of many reasons we are so deeply mired in this crisis, in this mess. And this comes from Tom Paget in Lexington. So I would like to know his purpose for writing and his point of view. Go ahead and pause the video and determine what his purpose and point of view are. Okay, so I think his point of view, he's talking here about the governor. So how does he feel about the governor? I think that he feels pretty positively about the governor. He uses phrase like exemplified the definition of leadership, that we can question his decisions, but not his leadership. So I get the feeling that he feels pretty positively about the governor. Now, when we look at what his purpose is, I think the author's purpose here is to definitely, I don't know, express an opinion. And when we talk about expressing opinion, that's definitely more of a persuade idea. So we're definitely trying to move on the persuasive part. Okay, last one we'll do together. Again, this one comes from a letter to the editor on the 25th. I am totally outraged. These brave souls are laying their lives and the lives of the families on the line to take care of their patients, whatever their position happens to be in the workplace. All the while, the corporations are raking in massive profits and paying their upper management huge salaries. This is not about politics. It's about taking a stand for our heroes and attempting to make sure they are taken care of after they risk their lives for all of us on a daily basis. Oh, wow. Okay. This comes from Deborah Bolton Plucknett of Sadiesville. So we want to know her purpose for writing and her point of view. And I want you to specifically think what is her point of view on the workers here? Oops. Yes, there we go. Now let's try to fix that spelling there. her point of view on her workers, and what is her point of view on the corporations. So go ahead and pause the video and make your decision about her purpose and point of view. Okay, so let's first talk about her purpose for, or her point of view on the workers. She calls them brave souls and heroes. She says they're laying the lives and their lives of their families at work. Um, she says that they risk their lives for us all daily. So I definitely think she has a positive view about the healthcare workers and what they're doing for us. Now for corporations, I think even though it's only in one sentence, I think we get the feeling of what she feels. We see all the while the corporations are raking in, not just making money, but raking in massive profits and paying their upper management huge salary. So not the everyday worker. So I think she feels pretty negatively about uh, the corporations. Now her purpose here again is to express an opinion, which I think is more on the lines of persuading. 
All right, everybody. So you have made it through our lesson on author's point of view. What I want to encourage you to do is make sure you are doing author's purpose and point of view every time that you read. Uh, the homework is on Google Classroom, so make sure you're looking for the reading skill, and we're going to be practicing with author's point of view for this lesson. If you haven't watched the author's purpose lesson, make sure you do that too, so you can kind of get both sides of everything. All right, everyone, as always, if you get stuck with anything or if you need a hand, uh, give me a call, send me an email, send me a remind message, and I will talk to you next time. All right, bye everybody.